Hi, everyone. I wanted to start with a story about a fisherman and a banker. There's a banker who goes down on vacation in Mexico and meets a fisherman. His fish are so delicious. And he comes back the next morning and says, hey, how come you don't have more fish? And the fisherman says, hey, you know, it's kind of simple. I wake up, I fish, I see my kids, I fish a little more, I drink a beer, and I go home and sleep. The banker looks at him with incredulous eyes. Have you heard of growth equity, he describes. The fisherman looks confused. He says, yes, we could raise some money. You could hire 10 new boats and fishermen, and you could get all these additional fish. It's like, then we could grow our operations and IPO the company, and you would make millions of dollars. But the fisherman looks confused, and he says, well, what would I do with a million dollars? And the banker says, well, you could sleep, fish, see your kids, take a nap, and then do that again. So today, my invitation to you is to see how are we fishermen and how are we bankers? So let's start with this number. So many people have this concept, this magical number that is calculated actually pretty simply. You take some assumptions about your life, a few financial projections, and then boom, you have a number that you can live off of for the rest of your life. And that becomes the holy grail. And what happens then? You take a vacation, you hang out with your kids, you exercise, but most importantly, you give your finger to the corporate life. But what's a number anyways? Here I want to tap into the research of Nobel Peace Prize winner Daniel Kahneman, who tries to look at the effect of income and happiness. You all have heard of the $75,000 test. That's, at the, that's, according to Kahneman, where your happiness flatlines. Any dollar beyond that point doesn't matter. Now, I know you're shaking your heads and wondering. I wonder too. That's a, a 709 square foot apartment in Tribeca. Sorry, Mr. Kahneman. And it turns out that the reason why that research is flawed is that rich people don't like filling out surveys. But one Harvard professor, Michael Norton, was able to interview a bunch of multimillionaires and ask them a simple question. How much wealth would you need to have a happiness of 10? And he asked those with one to two million and they said a little bit over two times. Two to five million, two times. Five to 10, 10 plus, you get the drill. And we know that there are a lot of people out there with a lot of money who do not feel like they are a happy 10. Tiny violin, I did not hit my number. I did work on Wall Street for 15 years, intense hours. I was really cheap when I worked there, distracted. And then four years ago, I quit to start Rad Reads, where I speak, blog, podcast, and coach. That's me today. I live by the beach. I did not hit my number, but I work 45 hours. I actually spend more money, and I am present and silly with my kids all the time. What happened? Well, let's go on a journey together from banker to fisherman, where we will do three things. We will reimagine what retirement means. I think that's where people get stuck. We will talk about the marginal utility, that common curve of the next dollar. And then we will redefine wealth together. Are you ready? So here's the first flaw of the number. It's that life isn't linear. Take the example of a 77-year-old man whose life expectancy is 78. He has one year to live, and he's modeling out his number. Should be pretty easy, right? Well, it turns out the standard deviation of life expectancies is 15. So there is actually a 34% chance that this young man, old man, lives to be 92. Now, how would you model that into a spreadsheet? Well, here's the second flaw. There's too many variables. And I talk to people in their 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s who are trying to 
model all these numbers together. So in the 30s, the variables are around family and why will I get married? Who will I marry? How many kids will I have? In your 40s, the questions are, will I stay married? And it's a lot about raising kids. And if they go to college, how many homes, cars? Then in your 50s, what's when your health starts to kick in and you're in, in that phase where you could still be working and you have to think about retirement. And guess what? Those are actually the easy variables. I know. It actually gets much trickier because will social security exist? That's a big wild card. Will we have 70% tax rates? And yes, it's probably not you, but the first person to live to 150 years old has already been born. So what I find happens is people say, well, I still want to hit that number. I'm just going to play it safe. And what they do is they assume the max value for each variable. 77, eight, will I live to be 77 or 92? Use 92. Well, I'm not sure if I want to have one kid or three kids. Use three kids. Tax rates are 39%. I'm going to assume 70. But that's like going into a Zog Sports soccer game and wearing shin guards, knee pads, a cup, elbow, elbow guards, a mouth guard, and a helmet. You would suck. You would have no fun. And you'd be missing the point. Not to mention, you'd look like this. So what happens is because of this overly conservative approach to the number, you get the classic Wall Street dilemma. When's the best time to leave Wall Street? After next year's bonus. But I'm here to tell you there's another path you can go from the banker to the fisherman. I want you to meet my spirit animal. Oh, whoops. That's not the one I was talking about. But you may have seen this article in the Times that talks about America's elite, wealthy, successful, and miserable. And there's a protagonist in that story. He's an, a Harvard HBS graduate who makes $1.2 million a year as, an, as a fund manager. Now, you would think he hit his number or he came damn close to his number. But here are some of his quotes. I feel like my life is going is wasting away. When I die, is anyone going to care that I earned an extra percentage point of return? If you spend 12 hours a day doing work that you hate, at some point it doesn't matter what your paycheck says. I'm jealous of everyone who had the balls to do something that made them happy. Now I want you to meet my actual spirit animal. His name's Clee Roberts. It's not actually him, but he's an accountant, self-employed in Vancouver Island. Every year, Klee works to a point where he knows he can cover the, his living expenses by the end of the year and save for his own retirement. And then once he hits that point, he takes the rest of the year off. And typically that's sometime, sometime around August or September. Now that is someone who has enough. Think about the juxtaposition between the investment manager and the accountant. So how do we get to be a CLE? Well, let's start with reimagining retirement. This is Teresa Amabile, a researcher at HBS. She interviewed hundreds of former consultants, bankers, and, ex and entrepreneurs and asked them, what do you like most about retirement? They said, control over their schedule, time with their family, and the pursuit of an avocation, which is a fancy word for a hobby. Now, that looks a little bit like a job to me. So here's an exercise for you. Instead of modeling that number, thinking about that number, I want you to start by working backwards. And if you can't answer this question, you have no business working on the number. The question is as follows. If you, had five, if you won the lottery, how would you spend the next five years of your life? This is, this is important that it's five years because you cannot do any one thing or even two things for five years. You can't sleep for five years. You can't travel for five years. You can't see your kids for five years or even exercise. And so what happens when we start working backwards? Well, let's sleep eight hours. I mean, come on. Let's spend three hours a day with our family, exercise, meditate, and read for an hour. That's 14 hours. That leaves 10 hours a day. But if you're living this life, by the way, there's no concept of the weekend. So my question to you is, 
how would you allocate 70 hours of your time if you didn't have to work for money? There are so many clues in that answer. Most people can't actually answer that question. And that makes sense. This is Jason Zweig, who writes about the psychology of money for, for the Wall Street Journal. He says, people don't know what makes them happy, what has made them happy, or what will make them happy. And so lost in that pursuit of the number is a deeper question of, do I know myself and do I know what actually makes me happy? The other problem with the number if you take that 70 hours, I would assume anyone listening to this video would want to solve complicated problems, have an impact on the world, um, work with cool people. The number discards all of that. That's, it describes a value of zero to that. And so what it's saying is, I just want one income stream, like a treasury bill, to pay for the rest of my life. But are you really that fixed income instrument? Are you a treasury bill? Or are you a stock that has growth potential where you reinvest in yourself? And as you can see, there's a big difference between how these two things perform over time. Why would you want to discount your human capital when you're in your 30s or 40s? And then there's the question about what the next dollar is worth to you. We'll talk about the marginal utility. That's the Kahneman curve. How do we shift along that curve? Here's an exercise that I give to my coaching clients. I give them this curve with no value on the x-axis. And I say, how do you get towards D? How do you slide up that curve? So for starters, most people are not at A and D. If they're at A, you're still not um, covering your basic necessities like food and shelter. And at D, you have a few money. They're somewhere between B and C. And what I found is so interesting. So why do people want to get to point D? Well, the first, point, first reason is because they want to stay as far as a, from A as possible. That is that fear that you will lose it all, that one mistake at work, and then you will get fired, you will be homeless, you will, all of your plans will fall through, and you'll put your family in danger. It's a very natural feeling, by the way, but that's called the scarcity mindset. On the other extreme, people want to move to D because they want more free time. Now think about that. Many people at C would be a partner at a law firm or at McKinsey. They are busting their asses, traveling nonstop, not seeing their kids because they're trying to make more money to then buy back more time. Think about that circularity. And let's think about where you can actually find more time. There's a lot of research that spending money to buy back time makes you happy. There's little ways like using a meal prep service or a travel agent instead of kayak to free up an hour or two a week. It could really move the needle. There are some bigger ways where you could decrease your commute. That's a big source of unhappiness or increase your childcare. Again, if you're at that point C, you probably can afford it if you don't have that scarcity mindset. And then the last one is to, is to actually radically transform your life. Now, that's not for the faint-hearted, but you can forego that. You could say, instead of trading time for money today, I just want more time. It's actually possible. And then finally, I want you to redefine wealth on your own terms. There's the very common and lame answer, your bank account and status. But think about all the other parameters, freedom, health, relationship, presence, impact, learning, joy. And then I wanted to share two of my favorite ways of redefining wealth. Only checking my email three times a day and never being rushed. And I think I'm doing pretty good on those two things. So here's my invitation to you. Be the DJ of your own life. Think of all these things, how much you work, how you trade time for money, how long you want to work for, what hours you choose to live, what you choose to work, your commute, as different knobs that you can tweak based on your life circumstances. You fade into one phase when you have young kids, phase out of it when, they're, when you become empty nesters. But don't think of that singular number because it's just constantly going to be changing. And so as you think of these knobs, think about it. Really think about how will you allocate those 70 hours? 
think about how will you find, where is, where are you on that marginal utility curve? Truly think about that. Decom deconstruct it. Some of them will be savings goals. Others you might discard. And then get creative about how you define wealth. Don't use the boring definition of status and bank, bank account number. Think about all of the beautiful things in life and all the wonderful virtues and skills that you have and how you could put them in the world for you, your family, and your communities. And most importantly, channel your inner clea. Thank you.